Hey guys, thanks very much for watching. My name's Joe and I work at Twine, which is a network that brings creatives together so they can work on awesome, inspiring projects all over the world and find the network they need to grow their career. Um, please say I'm joined today by Seth Haynes, who's a private marketing consultant who works with businesses and nonprofits. And he's also a musician who studied at Temple University, Philadelphia, where he earned his bachelor's degree in French horn performance. He also runs a blog called Musician's Guide to Hustling, which is also the title of his upcoming book, which is being released in a few months' time. Thanks very much for joining us today, Seth. It's really good to have you on and the chance to chat about lots of freelance-related stuff. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm happy to be here. Uh, and just, just one little edit there. The, the book is actually break into the scene. Ah, but, <laughs> ah right. But it's not, it's not actually out yet and published, so it's uh, <laughs> right. We're getting there. We're getting there. Okay. All good, man. All good. Um, I'm um, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. No problem. I'll make amends for that at the end. <laughs> <laughs> so All good. All good. I just wanted to start by talking about I signed up to the – email course thing you have uh, on your blog yeah. and the first email you mentioned that about a year ago you got fired from your first full-time job which started a really fascinating journey to where you are now could you briefly right. briefly explain the journey you've been on over the past 12 months or so uh yeah i can so i'll actually just to kind of contextualize things and place it for people i'll go a little further back so um, I'll kind of give a quick gist of like fill in the blanks of what, you know, bios are so like frivolous and things, but I'll, I'll kind of fill in the blanks because it's not all as uh, rosy as people's bios make it sound, you know? Um, <laughs> so, so I graduated from school and I basically kind of figured out like, all right, this isn't exactly what I want to be doing. Like the you know musicians that have been through like traditional classical music training or really any kind of like artistic training i mean there's like these these kind of like specific jobs in every industry right that like it's just kind of assumed that that's uh you know what you'll be doing and for me that was like i you know it was like orchestral music is a lot of fun i love playing it but the prospect of being like a full on orchestral musician did not excite me at all and it kind of stressed me out. So I was always interested in business and so I basically just started learning and teaching myself everything I needed to know. I picked up every book I possibly could about like marketing and business and copywriting and branding and all of these just tons and tons of things. So at the time I was actually, and this is how I got into that job that I recently got let go from, um, I actually was working in a parking garage when I graduated uh, school. So I was, that, I was like working in the parking garage during the day or the evenings and I was freelancing on the weekends. I had a few students and I did some teaching work. So I basically, this, this garage was for a social, um, like a social club in town called the Union League of Philadelphia, which is a very like kind of uh, prestigious, a little bit uppity place. You know, it's where a lot of like Philadelphia's elite hang out. And <laughs> Basically, there was a guy there that was like the president. He was like the guy that everybody was like, you know, oh, Frank, oh my gosh, Frank, he's so amazing. And like, he was, he's a really, he's like a really big deal around this club. And he was actually just recently appointed. He was a board member that stepped into the role of president for a local orchestra. So I knew this. I'd been following it in the paper, and there was a little bit of a media thing going on excuse me, with the um, previous music director and him. So there was this kind of like essentially a pissing match in the media that I was following. So I actually, you know, I'm, I was like, well, I'm pretty interested in this stuff. And, um, and you know, I know a lot about the music side of things and I'm learning about the business side of things. I'd like to talk to this guy. So I just went up went to him one day in the garage and started talking to him. And he gave me his card. Yeah, he kind of, kind of did like a, like a very kind, like brush off. So he said, "Yeah, send me an email." So I sent him an email. He didn't respond. So I talked to him again, and I talked to him again. Then I, then he said, "You know what? Call my office and talk to this person." I did. They didn't call me back. So I basically kept this up for like a month, and eventually he said, "You know what? I've got like half an hour next next Friday at four o'clock or whatever it was." So I actually took the day off work. I went and met him. And that Monday, I was walking in 
uh, to, to the office to meet with the vice president, and I got hired as a paid intern on the spot. Um, so I was there for about two years. I learned a ton, and you know, without getting into the details of the whole of the whole, if somebody wants to read the, more about this story, they can go to musiciansguidetohustling.com. It's it, you'll find it there. Um, and so I basically got let go. Um, they they wanted someone else. They wanted to basically re They wanted to change up the position, and I was no longer the right fit for the job. So I ended up getting let go. And to, so at this point, I had been working there for about two years, and I had been starting in the last like. About the time I started working there, so I was there for about two and a half years, I started doing some consulting stuff on the side. So I, someone would say, oh, do you know how to like set up an email list? And I would say, yeah, I do. I'll do it for you. No problem. Let me, yeah, just, just let me know what I can do. And then, so I, I would do it for them. And almost, I would probably say for the first year, I never actually knew what I was doing with anything. I just kept saying, yes, yes, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. Can you build a website? Absolutely. Can you, do you know how to write like copy for for this page? Yeah, of course I do. And do you know how to set up Google Analytics? Of course. And so <laughs> I would basically say yes, and then I would figure it out. Right. And uh, and just kind of using that as like kind of the springboard for for what I was doing, uh, I was able to learn a lot really quickly, and then apply that at my full time job. Um, and then I got let go after, after about two and a half years. So basically the second that happened to me, uh, you know, it's like that, it's like a, for anybody that's ever been like fired or yeah, I wasn't like fired. I was let go, which is basically, this is the nice way of saying you're fired. Um, but so I basically took that up as an opportunity, you know, as soon as like the kind of the shock wore off about a, a, a day later. Um, I was absolutely miserable at that job, so it was for the best, but I decided like, all right, this is the sign, because at this point, I had actually been making more money on the side, like just doing my consulting stuff, not even any, not even my freelance work or teaching, like just the consulting, I was actually making more money than my salary was, so it was kind of like, I'm spending this much time a month stressing about this job, being at work, thinking about it, being pissed off about something, just frustrated, irritated, miserable. And then on this other side, it's like I'm spending this much time a month doing stuff I actually like doing and I'm making the same amount of money. Like, why am I doing this? Like, this is a complete waste of time. So I basically ended up just saying like, all right, I had a few clients that like I had a regular like retainer clients and I had a couple of projects I had been working on. So I worked with, so I, I actually, I took a course online and worked with a business coach through the course. Um, and so I worked, we worked basically one-on-one -on -one for like six weeks. Um, I learned so much about, you know, I, I already know, like, I already knew like a lot of theoretical things about selling and I was pretty familiar with it. I was like, I was, I'm like, oh, I was like, okay at it, but uh, I got to be pretty good at it with, taking this course. So uh, basically I got fired and took that as the signal like, all right, this is it. Let's, uh, let's, let's do this thing. So that's basically kind of what I've been up to. So I've been, I do web design, I do consulting work. Um, so like people can hire me to manage like online advertising campaigns for them, create campaigns. Um, you just it's just anything in the world of communication online is really what I do. You know, I, I do traditional marketing stuff, but I don't really I don't really that's not my go to because most of my clients that's not the kind of work they want. But so that's basically the gist of a uh, the a little bit long winded version of that. <laughs> okay. And um, what have you found are the main mistakes or issues that musicians and other artists have in the way they're marketing themselves? Ooh, that's quite, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I would say probably the, the, I wouldn't say like it's the biggest mistake, but it's probably the biggest misunderstanding is that a lot of like creative types, you know, we, we tend to look at the world through a lens of like, uh, what a lot of entrepreneurs and business folks and 
just generally successful people will call like a scarcity, like a lens of like scarcity. So like they look at it from like a scarcity mindset um, where it's like there's very limited work. There are only so many opportunities and options out there, which I don't think is true. But they so they look at this, they look at the world as if there's very limited opportunity. So they feel like they have to do everything for everyone. So one of the biggest like challenges people make, and it's like a fundamental thing that almost everybody gets wrong, and it's really counterintuitive, is you should find who you want to do work for, what type of people, and then prob then I hate to I hate to use the word disqualify because that's like that sounds kind of negative, but you want to disqualify people from your services. So like you want to position yourself as the type of person that does like you know, specific kinds of work. And this doesn't mean you can only do one thing, but you want to make sure that you position yourself as the type of person that whenever someone has a specific type of job they need done, which there are tons and tons and tons of these. Um, and I can give a couple examples if you want, but you can, but they don't, they position themselves as someone that does everything. You know, I can do weddings, I can teach, I can do brass quintets, I can have, you know, I'm a horn player, I can have, you know, I can do orchestral stuff, I can do chamber things, I can do teaching artists work in classrooms, I can do this, I can, and they try to do everything. And there are people out there that do everything, um, but there are tons and tons of more people that are like really talented, you know, let's say like teaching artists, they do really well in like doing like educational kind of work or they're, they're getting involved in the community and schools, whatever it may be. And so, but the, but the big distinction there, I think is that it's kind of this is a thing that if you, if you apply to every, if you um, want to please everybody, you'll please nobody. Right. So that's like kind of the biggest thing I think. And we can get a little more concrete on that by saying, so just as an example, I'll give an example of like, uh, of like a music person and then someone that maybe is a, a graphic designer. So like to kind of make this more concrete for people that are listening. So let's say that there's a violinist and they really want to just get started freely. So they want to make some money and they say like, all right, I want to, and they put on their site, everybody lists on their, on their site and it's like, it's one of those things people list because they think they have to have it there, but they, it really doesn't matter most of the time. Mm -hmm. They'll say services. They'll be like, I can do private lessons, and I can do string quartets for wedding, and I can do corporate events, and I can do freelancing and orchestras, and I can do subbing, and I can do you know boom, 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 all these things. So anytime somebody looks at that website, they're going to say, oh, they can do a lot of stuff. Great. But let's re kind of like position this lens here and say, let's say that I'm a bride that wants someone to play. I want a string quartet at my wedding. So let's say that I'm a, I'm the client in this situation. If I land, let's, let's use two people as an example. And uh, I'll try not to get make all my answers as long as I'm making this one. But, <laughs> <laughs> but so let's say there are two options for this bride and they go to one person's website and it says, Oh, I can do everything. I do this, that, and the other thing. And then there's someone that says, you know, we do weddings for, you know, um, we do weddings and we do outdoor weddings. We have the gear for that on, you know, in, in this particular area and we, and they position it and they say like, okay, and we can do this. So we do custom arrangements of X, Y, Z pieces. And, and, and for every person that comes on, we do one custom arrangement for their wedding. So we want to make this super special for you. And then they give them a gift of sorts. And they say like, you know, here's a checklist of things. Even if you don't hire us, here's what you should look for when you're hiring musicians for your wedding. Like we get it. We know what you want. And who do you think that bride is going to go for? The person that says, I can do it all. Or the person that's like, no, we do weddings uh, in outdoor spaces of X, Y, Z thing, you know, and let's, and let's get even more specific and say they like kind of craft their design and their aesthetic to what someone that's maybe like, I know people that do weddings that do weddings that they don't really do the piddly, like kind of piddly shit weddings of like, you'll make, 75 bucks a person they do weddings where they charge you know fifteen hundred dollars for a string quartet to show up and play for an hour 
And wow. the reason they can charge that much is because they've demonstrated that they are far and away the right person for that example, for that client. Because yeah. the client looks at them and they say, oh my God, that's the person for me. They get it. You know, they've done weddings at like, you know, the Ritz Carlson's, the Four Seasons, all the, you know, and they, they're the ones I want because they've demonstrated that they're the ones that get what I'm looking for. And wow. just a really quick example for like, say someone else, so let's say you're a graphic designer um, and you are just the bee's knees at doing graphic design for corporate like real estate clients. Right. So let's say there's, again, let's use the two, the two designer person. There's a designer that says, I can do books. I can do websites. I can do print. I can do this, that, and the other thing. Boom, boom, boom. They list everything. And then you go to someone's site and, and all of their clients are listed. And so... Let's say I'm an executive at the at Hilton, and I'm looking for someone to design a website for an event we have coming up to promote a new building we're building in down to Hawaii or whatever. So let's and, and so if they go to the person the, the first person's website, and it says everything. They're like, eh, this person's probably not for me. But if they go to the website of the person that is that does work for like other hotels or other commercial properties and they can like show examples of their work and they can demonstrate to that client that they get it. That person is definitely going to want to hear more from the person that specifically positions themselves for that type of work. Does right. that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't know if you were deliberately using the word positioning because you were relating it back to the book. Positioning that marketing classic by Al Rees and Jack Trout. Oh, you know, I actually haven't read that, but I would love to because their other book. I was actually just thinking about it the other day because they have another book called The Twenty Two Immutable Laws of Marketing. Yes. That if anybody's watching this and hasn't read that book, and probably this other one too, Positioning, mm. go on Amazon and buy them like right now because yeah. it will change the way you look at every marketing decision you ever make. So Absolutely. I highly recommend that book. But yeah, I'm very intentionally using the word positioning because. Yeah, it's, it's all about, there's only a certain amount of information that we can all store in our minds. So right. when we think soft drink, we think Coca-Cola, for example, and if you were going up against them, there probably wouldn't be enough money out there for you to actually take them down in a marketing war one-on-one -on -one because no. <laughs> they already have the brand positioning in people's minds and they've built it up over such a long time because Absolutely. one of the key things really is, is time. But if you've not got time, then one of the other things, as you just pointed out, is building your own niche and then quickly demonstrating that you can do a really good job of that particular niche because in people's right. minds, that's what you're associated with. That's yeah, absolutely. And I would almost say that it's easier for people to take a step back from what their, from what their kind of conception, their perceptions of what they should be doing is and really questioning that and looking and 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 really kind of examining what it is that they uh, really want to be doing and the type of work they want to be doing and the clients they want to be doing work for. Because every creative, whether you're a musician, a, I don't care if you're an organist, a, a painter, an illustrator, or, you know, like a creative writer that, you know, that's writing novels, like, you know, there is an audience for your work. They're out there. It's and it's your job to make sure that you position yourself so that whenever they look to you, they know that like this is the girl for me. This is the woman for me. This is the dude for me. You know, right. and so it's it sounds like a lot of work, but I I can I will swear up and down on my marketing uh, on my marketing like grave that it's it's so much better to kind of get this right first. And if you're and if you're already twenty years into your career and you're kind of and you've always kind of struggled with this idea, it's never too late to start like retweaking how people perceive you because marketing is all about perception. Mm. It's all about, it's about attention and how that attention perceives you. So it's about getting the right eyes on you. And we could, I mean, we, I could, we could, we could talk for weeks about this months mm. and still have plenty to talk about. But when mm. it, co when it really comes down to it is like, when no matter what you have out on the internet or on your website or when people find you even in person it, you know, even the clothes you're wearing I mean everybody everybody is creating assumptions and 
Um, they're looking at you and they're creating and like it's your job to kind of craft that perception. Right. So like it's it's happening already. Like people already have a good idea about you or they think they do. And it's so it's your job to make sure that you can craft the narrative that you want people to think versus letting others kind of dictate that for you. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It, the other thing that's obviously a consideration for uh, any hire of a freelancer is, is the price. And there's obviously a big issue with work from developing countries being dirt cheap. Sure. Compared to creative freelancers in uh, you know, developing nations. What can we do to avoid this race to the bottom and encourage freelancers to get paid properly for the work they do? Yeah, so this is a this is a tough thing, and I'm actually gonna go. I'm actually gonna reference back to what we were just talking about eventually. But the the thing that a lot of people I think worry about, you know, because there are a million sites out there now where they're essentially democratizing the process. So and so there are some people that can get on something like say 99designs.com or Design Crowd or or you know. All of the, yeah, there are a million of these resources. I mean, that was the, the part of the guest post I wrote about in your site. Um, so there are always going to be a million resources out there. And it's it's getting to the point now where I think um, there's more options than ever, which which is a little intimidating for people, I think. So, But what I would say to that is that there will always be a marketplace for more the more value you can bring to clients, the, there will always be a demand for people that can over deliver and give more value to the customer than others. So what I mean by that is that there is, you know, if you were, I mean, let's use, let's use another uh, example here. So like if I was a, you know, a private instructor of anything, like I was teaching, you know, an art class or whatever, or I was teaching a, you know, a cello student, a friend of mine actually, who was just on, who will be on, who I just interviewed for my site. Uh, she gave me a great example. She's, she builds teaching. She built a teaching studio for herself really, really successfully. And, and so she lives in New York where it's super duper crowded there. Are, and there will always be somebody that's cheaper than you. I don't care who you are, where you live in the world, whatever it is you do, there's always someone that will do what you can do for cheaper. And like, I think the thing is to just accept that and, and don't, and honestly don't really worry about what they're doing because the people that are paying them to do that work at that level do not value the work that you have to do at that level. So you shouldn't even worry about it. You don't want to work with those people. The people that pay $20 for a logo are not going to hire a high-end design agency to spend, I mean, to spend, you know, $50,000 on rebranding their, like, you know, four-letter logo, <laughs> you know? Right. So, so I'm trying to, sorry, I'm, like, talking myself in a circle here, but the, mm. so the thing, the thing that you can, um, that anybody can do is always try to add more value. So back yeah. to the example of my friend, is you know so she teaches cello lessons in Brooklyn, New York. Um, for anyone that's a musician or anything or any kind of creative type, I mean, you could probably guess that New York is a very crowded market. There are a lot of people teaching, in this example, cello lessons in Brooklyn. So one of the things that my friend Kieran does, and uh, so Kieran, if you watch this, this is a great idea. Thanks for the, thanks for uh, the example. But <laughs> we um, we were talking, and she was like, "Well, you know what I do." Every single student that comes to me, because you know she teaches at younger students, so her customer is the parent. It's not the student; it's the parent that's paying for lessons. So she gives every single person that comes to her like a checklist of here are where here's where you can get instrument rentals in the city for good good prices. Here's what you should look for in teachers. Here's here's what they should be learning in the first year or so. Here's how to get them started and off on the right on the right foot and. The reason this is so valuable is because her customer, I mean, you have to understand who your customer is and what they care about and what you can help with. So 
in her case, the customer is almost always like probably a middle to middle upper class parent who has a son or daughter that they want to start taking cello lessons. And whenever someone, so let's say it's like a 10 year old that wants to start taking cello lessons. What is that? So you should, you should be thinking about what does this parent want out of this process? Like what are they re why is they having their kid take cello lessons? And if you can understand that, then you can understand, you can start to understand the ways that you can bring a lot of value to them. So my friend Kira, I mean, she charges probably a lot more than, than, than other people do. Uh, and it's because, because she brings more value to her customers. The amount of money you charge is directly proportionate to the amount of value you bring to the customer. Like there are so, so, and so in her example, you know, sending them a list of everything they need to get started, even if their kid isn't necessarily like wanting to go to like, you know, Manhattan School of Music or Juilliard or, you know, but they probably just want, you know, and this is just a, I'm just shooting from the hip here, but like what they would probably love is that when Christmas time rolls around when all their family's over, their kid can go pull his cello out of his room and play. We wish you a Merry Christmas for his family or something like by the right. fire with, you know, everybody sitting around having a glass of wine or something like if you can figure out whatever it is and position your product to meet that demand, and give them more value than what other people are doing, whether that's giving them free bonuses, always go above and beyond just a little bit of what you promise people and they will remember you. So if you, if you can bring more value to the, the customer, you can command higher prices. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think that's really good advice. Okay. And the freelancer that lives in like Indonesia that charges two twenty five an hour for logo, for graphic design work, like they're not doing that. No, like, and to be honest, most people are not doing this. Almost nobody is doing this well, and I guarantee in any space there is nobody doing this stuff well. And if you're and if you're curious, go check out the competition. Like go Google, like if you're a t music teacher, go Google French horn lessons in, you know, London or whatever it is. See what comes up, see what everyone else is doing. If you're a graphic designer that wants to do like corporate work, you know, go check out the work of the agencies. If you want to do work for like big corporate clients or whatever it is to pay to, you know, to make a, a good chunk of change on a project, like check out what the other people are doing. What are the big design agencies in town doing? I guarantee you whenever those clients come in, they feel like royalty. They have like, you know, whatever they want to eat, whatever they want to drink. I mean, you know, and, but they're paying a lot of money for that service. And so they're getting the proportionate, if not more value than what they're paying for. Right, exactly. And something I just like to, Add into there is I don't know. Please. Have you read Seth the Lean Startup, the book? Yeah, Eric Ries. Yeah. So just to add in there, I think something important for freelancers to consider is when you're trying to identify what your creative niche is, it's important that you don't throw a load of resources into something that actually the clients aren't interested in. So it's really important <laughs> when you're doing the research that you're identifying what the customers are needing, you're doubling down on the things that they need, on the things that they value. Because the important, right. thing, the important thing about value is that it's what's valuable to them. Like they're, right. di they're dictating the market of the, mon of the yeah, money. Yeah, it's not about what you get. think is valuable. It's about what they think is valuable. Exactly, and it's about making sure you don't waste any resources on things that aren't valuable to them. Absolutely, yeah, that's a, uh, for anybody listening or watching, that is a, a little little piece of gold advice to put in your pocket and carry with you forever, because it's, <laughs> it's not about you, it's about them. They don't care about you, really, and it's not, and this is not to say like, oh, you're not worth it or whatever, but like, no. they care about themselves. If they're spending money on a service, they're spending their time, energy, resources, things they cannot necessarily get back, Yeah, they want you to deliver for them what right. they want and it's your job to understand that and then fill that market fill that need exactly and that 
moves nicely into, I want to talk about how to write emails that engage people and actually communicates that message to potential clients. And I know, Seth, that you've got on your blog, or I think one of the emails um, that I received as part of a course had a template for yeah, yeah, yeah. that you found worked really well. But just going on a bit of a higher level than that rather than actually digging down into what words to use. Right. I just wanted to talk a bit about how you can actually communicate the fact that you're the best person to deliver the work that the client finds valuable to them. What's the best way to do that, you know, to write engaging copy and how can people start improving their text so that it's not just an advert for them that bores their customers and makes them seem arrogant, but also at the same time sells them as that person who will deliver what they want to the best, highest level possible. Right. So the first thing I, I would say, there's just kind of a couple of little checklist items that every time you reach out to anybody, especially if you like need something for them or want something to come from the exchange, it's like, um, like in your favor because they have all the leverage in that situation. So um, the first thing I would say is that no email should be super long. It's, if you're the first, the first time you're reaching out to somebody, it should be like five. I actually say like if it's more than five sentences, it's too long because if you go into a situation where they don't know you, they don't necessarily know you, they don't know anything about you, they don't, they probably don't care, um, and you are sending this big bomb of like you know paragraph copy, um, the chances of them reading it are probably going to be um, pretty low. So the, you know, there's, a, there's a general kind of rule of thumb in any kind of selling or marketing, and it's just make it easy for them to say yes. So the first thing I would say to do is, I mean, you know, if I was going to kind of outline this, I kind of talk about this in um, a, a post on my site where really the thing that you could do whenever you're pitching anybody to kind of make sure that it's... Um, really valuable for them or, or that it's or that it's effective for you when you're pitching them and it's like and it's useful for them is first off you know just give them a, a very quick intro of who you are what and what it is uh, you want and what you can do for them so you want to provide value to them so like whenever you email these people I mean, we're, we're always coming back to this idea of adding value adding value understanding what it is they want and positioning yourself to be the solution to their problem that's what all of entrepreneurship or anything is it's finding a problem it's what all business is it's finding a problem and then positioning yourself as the solution and charging for that solution so right. So, you know, you want to make sure you can provide value for them. Give them an idea of something they could be doing better. You know, what, what, if you look at their, like, I mean, one, one of the things that I always do is I, I always give a free gift of some kind whenever I, whenever I reach out to people. And I've done some, like, cold outreach to people and actually gotten pretty big projects out of it because I went in knowing a ton about their business already. I did all the research, and I actually put together – these little video presentations sometimes where I'll literally say like, here are three ideas of ways you can double revenue in the, in the next year, or, you know, here, here are ways you can get more students in for this or whatever it is. And I just, I just put like a little slideshow on my screen and I just narrate and talk through like, for like five minutes. Here are three things you could do that won't damage your brand that can bring, you know, they can save you money, earn you money, save you time, whatever it is. So, right. So friendly intro, provide value for them, something of value. Um, social proof is something that should be incorporated in anything you ever do. Um, so social proof, what I mean by that is like, you want to be able to demonstrate legitimacy for yourself very quickly. So you can say like, you know, I've done work for X, Y, Z, other things, you know, things they recognize and care about. Um, and so like if you're a freelance you know, musician, you could say, well, I've done work with these XYZ local orchestras. I've been, I've done work on this chamber series, or if you're a, you know, a, an illustrator, you know, I've done, I've done work on these types of, these types of books or projects or whatever it is, you know, I've done, 
whatever it is, you just want to make sure that they look at you, they look at that and know like, okay, this person is legit because I, you know, you want to, you want it to do those things to be something they recognize. So it, it's going to lend you a lot of credibility. Um, and then the, the, the next thing I would say is just make it really easy for them to say yes. So whatever it is, and if it's the first time you're emailing somebody, a great goal for any time, especially if it's cold email, is to just get a response. So just say, you know, what I would actually say is like, whenever you go to provide value, just say like, hey, I've got three ideas of ways I think you can double your bottom line and this in this coming year or here's how you can get more work or here's how you can get more gigs or more you know more visitors to click through on your website or your, if you're a web designer whatever it is and then say would it be okay if i share these with you and just ask like hey do you mind if i share these with you and because that will get them to say yes please of course if it's something of value and something they care about and you're offering to give it to them for share it with them for free they'll respond uh and then you know, then the last thing is just thank them for their time. Just be really quick. I mean, this is this email would take thirty seconds to read. So uh, that was that's what I would say for anybody cold emailing anything. It's the kind of use that structure. You know, just introduction, demonstrate some value to them, give a little social proof so they know you're legit. Ask if it's okay if you share some of these ideas or, or get permission for them. And make it easy for them to say yes to you. And then thank them for their time. They're busy, and get off, get you know, hop off board and move on because you don't want, um, you don't want to cut. You want to make it short, brief, so they can look at it and say yes or no in like less than a minute. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's great you said that because that's something that's been validated through Twine. I've had several freelance creatives come to me and say, you know, I'm pitching on a project and there's been. You know, 200 other people that I've seen that they also been pitching in. So there's an enormous amount of competition for right. a post. But what they've realized they need to do is engage with that person's portfolio. So make comments, give them feedback on their work, saying, hey, I, I love this particular song you've done, or I love this graphic you've done. And then also try and find ways all the time to engage with them in non-business related ways to then build up the connection so that they trust you enough to then right. do that project together. Because otherwise, it's just a, a list of blank names to that person. They can go Absolutely. through and they can search for each person, but they've not got the trust. And this is why I often say the best way to get signed to a record label is to collaborate with an artist on that label, or at least an, an artist yeah, on, a, on a label associated yeah. with that label. Yeah, I mean, and that, and that, that just doing like that one thing as an example would... It would, it would cover a lot of those items we just talked about. I mean, it would A, make it easy for them to say yes. That was, that's a lot of social proof because they've already invested in this other person. You're collaborating with them. So they know, they know and trust that person. So that trust almost comes over to you. Yeah. And, and like that's probably of some value to them that you've created content with one of their artists and pushed their artists out there a little bit more into your space. But yeah, I mean, this is this is all like, um, this is the kind of thing that people will look at and they'll like not know what to say. They'll stress out about it and they'll, it'll spend half an hour trying to write an email. They'll get frustrated and just close the computer and <laughs> they won't do it. So yeah. like, that's why I provide these templates and scripts for people on my site. You know, if there's any, anybody is curious about it, feel free to go to musicians guide to hustling.com and you can find it. It's, it's in the very first post I ever put up, but like, um, it's, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that can be really, really overwhelming very easily. So I think it's really important to like simplify it, almost create like a template that you can use that you can just replicate the process because um, it'll save you a lot of mental energy. Right. And then in terms of the other side, so chase, once you've got that work, how do you chase up clients effectively to make sure that they pay on time and that if they're not responding well, or they're not treating you well. After the process, they've, you're not leaving it on bad terms, so they might hire you again. Yeah, well, I would say in terms of payment, I mean, that's a tricky thing for anybody to deal with because we've all, I'm sure anybody that's done any kind of freelance or client work out there has had some crappy experience where they got burned by somebody. Um, 
Yeah. And I would say the most fundamental thing that you can and should do for any project you're working on is ask for a deposit up front. Right. So, you know, whenever you send over your proposal and like a contract for them to sign, whatever it is, you should do that. I've had, I've had nightmare stories where I didn't do that with people and I lost a lot of control on the project um, and it turned into like total crap and it was frustrating and, and it was, and it just did not end well for me. And, um, you know, and I still once in a while get kind of caught up in these things, you know, accidentally, it just happens sometimes. So, but mm -hmm. getting a deposit from somebody is huge because there's a, you know, that, that is, that essentially that puts some skin in the game for them. It creates a fair amount of, it creates commitment. Mm -hmm. uh, which is if anybody's interested in this kind of topic, um, there's, there's a great book by Robert Cialdini called influence. And it's basically about all the psychological triggers people have. It's like probably the one of the most useful marketing books ever written. And it's not even about marketing um, because it, it, it literally just kind of outlines um, the process and like the psychological triggers that people have. Um, so that's what I would say is that they get a deposit up front, have a contract and at the end of the project, in terms of making them hire you again, again, I'm going to just throw this out there one more time. If you can go above and beyond a little bit of what the original promise was mm -hmm. and add some extra value on top and leave them with a good taste in their mouth, you know, the chances are pretty good they'll hire you again. If you leave on great terms, you're in the project, they're really pleased with the work, you're happy working with them, there's no reason you can't work together again soon, if you, especially if you add a lot of value to them on top of what you've already done. So that's what I would say about that. And do you think it's better to work per hour on projects or per project? I think it varies. Um, I do, sometimes I do hourly. I tend personally to charge project-based fees just because depending on who the client is, what the circumstances are, obviously this is completely like situational, but um, you know, I think, it, I think it very much varies on the project because you know, every, every project is unique and has its own set of like um, pros and cons and challenges and things that work and things that don't work. So I don't really think there, I don't really have like a blanket statement on, on that. I think just go with what makes the most sense at the time and, you know, just do your best, do your best. You know, you, you know, whoever it is watching or listening to this, like you can, you know what makes sense for you in that situation. So uh, but the best thing you can do with any pricing is be crystal clear with people when you're getting started about what the expectations are, about your time and everything. Because, um, and I, this is something I struggle with myself. I'm dealing with a client right now that's like a total like um, nightmare. Like it's a, it's been a very like the project's gone way longer than it should have, um, and it's just. And it, it was my mistake. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't super duper. I thought I was clear, but I wasn't clear enough. And so, you know, and this, I have these problems all the time. I still have these problems. And so, but if you can be really transparent with your, with like the expectation of your time and make sure everyone's on the same page, if you can get all that out of the way in the document that they signed, the contract or proposal, whatever it is, um, you'll be in good shape. Excellent. I think that covers everything. I wanted to talk about. So thanks so much, Seth, for joining us today. It'd be great to get you in again to chat more because we could talk, as you said, for weeks yeah. on this topic. So it's awesome. Yeah, man, this is a lot of fun. I appreciate it. I appreciate <laughs> you, know, you taking the time, Joe, and all the, uh, all the team over at Twine for everything. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, no problem. Well, so guys, to check out um, Seth's work, go to sethhames.com and also check out Musician's Guide to Hustling.com, and also his new book, Break Into the Sea, which is going to be released when, Seth? Uh, I'm shooting for early October. I'm uh, in the editing process now. I'm laying out the marketing plan, and I'll be sending it out to beta readers on my, from my list very soon. So it's, uh, the gears are turning. The gears are turning. As a, hmm. you know, we're recording this in early August, so I've got about... A little over two months or so to get this uh, get this thing going. So it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a big project, but we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> so about early October is when it um, when the book is expected to come out. 
Awesome. Well, guys, I, I'd thoroughly recommend getting a copy when it's out. If you want to get gigs and you want to get your career off the ground, then I'm sure it'll be a really valuable resource. But I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, Seth. Um, yeah, man. Take care, everyone. Have a good day.